All right. So um, I was going to give this spiel about how browsers are horrible, even in modern day and age. And what I discovered this morning is that my penance is that I get to spend an hour messing with um, video adapters. They are apparently also horrible. Um, anyway, so I am going to be um, talking a little bit about how uh, browser bugs are prevalent, even in the modern day of like HTML5 and jQuery and all those nice things. Um, I work at the Wikimedia Foundation where I work on a project called Visual Editor. And we like pushing the boundaries of what browsers can do. And um, in doing so, we find that sometimes it doesn't quite work. And that's uh, seeing it, that's putting it mildly. So um, back in the old days, web development was hard. Like you had to write everything three times with three different browsers. Like you would have to write very verbose code like this. And in case you can't figure out what this does, it um, that reason the reason for that is because we write it like this now, which is much more concise. Um, also, come come to me after this talk if you can spot the bug in this code above because it doesn't actually work. Um, if you wanted to debug code, you would do things like this. You would put alert statements in your code, and if you were lucky, they alerted strings, and if you were less lucky, they alerted unusable garbage like this. And you know, nowadays we have browser consoles that can dump like objects and DOM nodes and they can manipulate the DOM live and you have debuggers with call stacks and deminify this code buttons and you have inspectors that show you where everything is on the page. You know, the modern web is wonderful. Um, back in the day, if you wanted to do something cool, you could, you, you could abuse browser bugs to animate the title of the page like this. And nowadays, if you want to do something cool, you just say that you want to animate something or you know, you can, you can write stuff like, uh, like this in four lines of CSS, which is you can have a button with rounded corners with one line of code instead of four images. And you can make it change its color on hover. And you can, in fact, animate that uh, color change with just a couple of lines of CSS. So, you know, in modern times, things are easy. We have jQuery. It papers over all like the little differences between browsers. You have HTML5, HTML5 and CSS. And like back then, browsers were pieces of garbage. I took a screenshot of healthcare.gov in IE6, and this is what it looks like. And you know, and um, yeah, if you guys want to admire the, the, the wonderfulness that is healthcare.gov in IE6 for, for a little bit longer. Um, and you know, this is what it looks like in Chrome 34, because Chrome 34 is a modern browser, and modern browsers work. Well. That sort of breaks down if you, so if you go a little bit deeper and try to push the limits and, um, and try and do interesting things. Because the truth is, browsers are kind of still pieces of garbage. And they only kind of work, and only in the cases that people use the most often and that the browser developers thought of. Because browser manufacturers are kind of like those children that clean their room by sticking all the stuff in their closet. It looks great, and as soon as you touch a door, you will be, you will be buried in like a pile of junk. Um, the problem is, with all this HTML5 and CSS3 stuff, with all our demands that you be able to animate a border color, which is a three-dimensional property, by the way, um, in a single line of CSS, um, we keep pushing more and more complexity on browsers, while at the same time, we're trying to make them more stable. And in engineering, it doesn't actually work that way. Modern browsers are very complicated, and therefore, they have lots of bugs. So first of all, I'm going to take a minute to bash Chrome. And don't worry, I'll be bashing Firefox later. Um, Chrome has this lovely thing um, where box shadows are interactive, and they're really not supposed to be. Um, so this over here, let me see if I can get a mouse cursor on the, on the screen. This over here is a box with scrollable content and things that highlight when you mouse over them. And it's got a pretty big box shadow. I think it's like ADM or something stupid that you would never use in real life. But the interesting thing is, if I move my cursor out of the box into the shadow, um, it's actually still interactive. And I can, if you can tell there's a little gap there, and then it picks up again, because that's actually a next item, which is hiding behind the box shadow. Um, and the great thing that I can do is I can put my mouse here, and I can turn the scroll wheel, and it will actually scroll this box. It's amazing. And I can do this at the top, too. Um, obviously, this doesn't happen in Firefox. It also doesn't happen if you make your elements inline block and then with 100% and do some other line height tricks to make it work, because this one down here does not have this problem. Um, but you know, if you have 
buttons that people are meant to click on um, super, with box shadows, and they are right above, uh, right adjacent to things that are scrollable, you get some pretty weird things happening, and you have no idea why, unless you happen to discover this. And so, of course, we work around this by making everything inline block and um, then making the width 100% and messing with the other CSS until it looks right, looks right again. But, you know, ideally you wouldn't have to. Um, yeah, so that's what it looks like. I designed these slides so that I would be able to do them if I didn't have a browser, so occasionally you will see a screenshot of what I was trying to do. Um, image rendering is also very difficult uh, for Chrome. Sometimes you will just get random bits of your desktop um, com intercomposed with your image. Uh, font rendering, in fact, is even harder. Um, there is this wonderful bug in Chrome, which I think might be specific to Mac OS as well, um, where sometimes it will randomly um, free the memory used by your font, and so it will render things in a different font. Um, however, as you can see from the underlines and the link there, um, it's actually doing the measurements using the correct font, which has smaller letters. So the layout of the page is not actually affected. Your lines are not actually affected. Nothing is affected except from the font that the user sees things in. And um, this um, made for a pretty hilarious video that was submitted to the bug report where um, I think you can see the font change like 10 times in 18 seconds or something. And I think the next time he scrolls, it's like only going to change the first paragraph or something. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. Um, another thing that's very difficult to do is um, CSS3 selection colors. So um, in CSS3, you're allowed to customize selection color. So I'll just demonstrate right here that this is my native selection color in my operating system. It's orange. But here, I set some CSS to make it blue, to make it look more like Mac OS X. And that works great right up until the point where you try to select across a list. And Chrome will decide that, obviously, you also meant to select the members in the list, which, by the way, are not actually in the content and will not actually get copied if you copy the selection, and also give you no way to style how those are selected. Um, the only reason this works in Firefox is because Firefox isn't, isn't stupid enough to try and select them in the first place. Um, so that looks like that. Um, selection in general just turned out, turns out to be hard. Um, this is um, text in a content editable, so you can like type here. Um, but this text here is inserted using um, colon before in CSS3. Um, and if you try to select this, it will actually select a text over there, <laughs> which, you know, I can drag and drop it to if I want to. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, the correct behavior, by the way, is if you click here. So I guess if I click here, it drops the cursor there. If you click there, it should just drop the cursor at the first position it is editable, not a randomly mapped onto an editable region uh, thing. Um, in fact, selection is just incredibly difficult. Because um, in this page, the A's are just straight up text, but the B's are wrapped in spans that are then absolutely positioned and then made to be put in the exact same place that were before. And if you try to select that, Chrome just goes crazy. OK, notice there's now a double line in the middle of the screen. And it gets better. And my favorite is somewhere over here, where it's actually like there's actually a line that's sticking out beyond the box here. It's, um, oh yeah, some of the B's are white, some of them are black, some of the A's are white, some of the A's are not there at all. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, these are some of the screenshots that I captured with um, interesting selection behavior. Um, Chrome also really believes that um, dead scroll bars deserve to be mourned. Because um, if you have a list here, and you might recognize this from a previous demo, um, you can make it scrollable. And you would do that by setting two CSS properties. You would, you would limit its height so that it has um, less height than it has content to fit it. Um, and you would give it a property called overflow y auto, which makes it uh, automatically scroll if there's too much content. Um, if you wanted to make it full height, again, you have to unset both of these things. You have to both give it full height and remove the overflow property. Depending on in which order you do these, and depending on whether you force the browser to re-render in between, um, you might just get this back, which is what you would expect. This is what happens if you first give it full height, then force the browser to reflow, and then give it, then remove its overflow property. Or you could do these things in the reverse order, and you would get this, which um, is not very obvious right here. But um, 
if you sort of look at it closely, you can see that there's a little bit of space here that shouldn't be there. And it is much more obvious in the zoomed in scroll, uh, screenshot that I have that it will just randomly decide that you know, the scroll bar really deserved that amount of space that was reserved for it, even though it's not there anymore. Um, again, you can work around. This is really confusing if you have um, a list with search suggestions that are sometimes scrollable, sometimes not, that like become blue and highlight. Um, you can work around this by setting things in exactly the right order and causing reflows at exactly the right time. But um, ideally, you wouldn't have to. Um, so those are, those were just a quick round of rendering bugs in Chrome. And Chrome, in particular, is so high performance that it doesn't even work properly. Because if you need to re-render things and don't actually re-render them, that's better performance. Um, but um, Chrome has also got some funny uh, UI things. And I was able to um, make some slides for one. So this is a pretty standard thing. Uh, there is an event called before unload that you can listen to. And then if the user tries to leave the page, the event will fire. And you can prevent them from leaving the page by giving them this interstitial dialogue that says, are you sure you want to leave the page? And they can, cho they can choose yes or no. Um, so OK, that's all pretty standard. But you could also try to reload the page. Now they have thought of this. And I have to give it to them. They've actually thought of something here. Um, there is a separate dialogue called confirm reload with like different button captions and everything. It's, it's pretty nice. Um, and it asks you if you're sure that you want to reload the page. So now, what would happen if I reloaded the page and you know, clicked confirm that I actually wanted to reload the page, and then before it actually started reloading, so very quickly, I try to close the tab? Well, I get this dialog which is not what I expected. I expected to get the, do you want to leave this page dialog? But it asked me if I want to reload again, even though I tried to close the tab. Um, what's particularly amazing is if I click reload this page, Chrome closes the tab. What do you think will happen if I click don't reload? It proceeds to reload the page. <laughs> All right, so um, that was just a quick round of browser bashing. And so I will now mix it up with a longer saga of how some things are just horrible to get to work in any browser at all. Um, so there's this array function called splice. And you can use it for inserting items into an array. Um, so here I've created an array with A, B, C, and D. And then this, this second line is a little bit compact. What it says is, um, go to the place after the second item. So in this case, that's after the B. Um, remove zero items and insert X and Y. And so as you can see, it did, in fact, insert X and Y between um, like after A and B, between the B and the C. Um, so this is, this is nice if you want to insert things in the middle of something. But um, this, the calling style here is variadic. So I have to uh, pass every single thing that I want to insert as a separate argument. And if I were to pass an array there, it would just take that array and insert it as a nested array into my array, which is not what I want. So you know, what if I want to insert an array of items? Fortunately, JavaScript is a functional programming language, and so we have tools for this. Um, there's a roundabout way that you can do it. Um, there's a function called apply that you can use to construct an array of arguments that you want to pass to a function. And so we can actually construct a two, comma, zero, comma, all the stuff we want to insert, and then pass it to that, and that all works. And so you know this works if you want to insert an array of items. Um, but the thing is, we are blowing up like the length of the array here, because you know there might be many items in our array. And so this works. I can create an array of 500 things. And I can generate my arguments array, which will now have 502 arguments. And it all works fine. But splice, in the meantime, is getting called with 502 parameters. You know, How sustainable is this? How far can we take this? What happens if I pass too many parameters? How many is too many? Do I get an error? What happens? So these are difficult, profound questions. So let's ask the ECMAScript spec. It says nothing. Um, it, I don't believe that it mentions. I think it mentions something that, like in practice, implementations may have limits to how many arguments you can pass. But it doesn't specify what those limits should be. It doesn't specify how many arguments you should be able to pass at least. It doesn't specify what should happen, what the interpreter should do if it believes there are too many. It's completely unspecified. So what that means is you have to do some experimentation. So in Chrome, um, you can pass up to 131,072 arguments. And if you pass more than that, you get um, a kind of misleading error message that says maximum call stack size exceeded. It's the same error message that you get if you try to do recursion too deep. 
which in practice means infinite recursion because you have to recurse like thousands of times before it happens. Um, I guess it's technically true because the arguments do go on the call stack and it makes the call stack too big, but it's misleading. So in Firefox, you can pass more. You can pass half a million, and you get a very descriptive error message that tells you exactly what went wrong. Um, in Opera 12 and below, you can pass two million arguments, um, and you get a reasonably specific error message. And I say 12 and below because starting with Opera 15 or 17 or something, they started basically being reskinned Chrome, and it behaves exactly like Chrome now. Um, in Safari, which uses the old WebKit uh, JavaScript core interpreter, you can only pass 64K, which I think is the lowest limit that I've seen in the wild. Um, in IE10 and above, you can pass 262,000. These numbers are all different, but at least they're all powers of two, which is good. Um, I, ha I haven't actually found one that wasn't a power of two. That would be interesting. Um, and you get error out of stack space, which is you know, concise, but kind of accurate. In, IE, in IEs before 10, so I9 and below, there does not appear to be a limit. I've gotten it to take 33 and a half million arguments and then gotten an error that said that it was out of memory. Like, not out of memory for the stack, out of memory for the browser. <laughs> so, you know, solid engineering. Um, the solution to our problem was we decided to use a supply supply approach and cut up the, ins the array that we wanted to insert in batches of 1,024 items and insert them. Um, that seemed fairly safe given that the lowest uh, limit that we'd seen was 64,000. However, we assumed that if the call to splice didn't crash, that meant that it was correct. And because, you know, as long as splice takes all the arguments, we assumed that they would actually all get inserted and that everything would be fine. Because, you know, splice is a pretty basic operation and, you know, that would always be, browsers would never screw it up, right? It's, pretty, it's a pretty easy operation. Well, that turned out to not be very true either. Um, so in this particular case, um, this is in Chrome, which behaves correctly. Um, I've created an empty array, and then I've assigned x to be the seventh element, the a, a sub six, which means that I now have an array with a bunch of holes in it, so it says undefined times six, and then an x. Um, then I can say after the seventh element, so all the way at the end, insert y, and it will go and do that, and it'll have six gaps and an x and a y. So this all works perfectly, and if you try this in Opera 12 or lower, um, you get exactly the same result. It renders a little bit differently because that's how Opera's inspector does it, but this is the same, this is fine, this is exactly how it should work. So now I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but I'm going to make my index slightly higher. So I'm gonna add 250 to everything. So now I assign x to um, a sub 256. So I get 256 gaps and then an x. And then I splice in y at index 257 and that all works fine. I get an array of length 258. Um, if you try to do this in Opera, then your X will just disappear into nowhere. If you try to do this in Opera, you have an array with an X, you insert a Y after it, your Y will be in the correct position and it will be the only thing in, that is in the correct position because everything else is gone. Um, I wasn't able to, um, this is an old bug that we like worked around last year or the year before last, so I wasn't able to come up with um, a more impressive reproduction case in this one, but we have seen cases where things just get jumbled and shifted all over, and um, generally within the first 200, like 256 appears to be a ma magic number. If you try to, to do, try to do this for any lower value, it will work fine. If you try to do this for any higher value, it will always fail. Um, and so we have a function that is almost exactly this, <laughs> except it doesn't have the same name because we like our function names to be unique, and we need more than one of these functions. Um, <laughs> but other than the name, I think it's called is splice broken or, so, or something, and it's used to decide whether we should polyfill splice um, to work around the browser broken inflation or just use a native one. Um, so yeah, that's always interesting if you know math doesn't work in your browser. So um, as a quick intermezzo before I start talking about more difficult things, let's talk. Let's bash on Firefox for a little bit. Um, there is a pretty, good, pretty uh, awesome bug in Firefox where if you have a link that contains superscripted text and you have an underline in hover, then on hover, the underline will appear as an overline for your superscripted text. And it is actually more profound than that. If you have any sort of underline in hover um, thing and the text has a vertical align property, then the lines will appear above. Um, this 
actually turns out to have been fixed in Firefox 33, which hasn't been released yet, but will be in whenever it happens. Um, so that's good. Current version is 30, apparently, according to my slides. Um, this is also a pretty fun one. Um, in a, um, if you have a content editable div, so this is a div that you can type in, um, when you click on a link, it doesn't actually follow the link because instead it wants to allow you to drop the cursor there so that you can type. So that's, you know, that's okay, but you might have noticed that when I mouse down on the link, it actually still colors it as active, which is interesting. Um, and that produces interesting effects when you select because if you do this, the link doesn't change color. But if I do this, the link does change color. While selecting, I'm not even mousing down on the link anymore. I'm already off the link. If I release the mouse button, it will be fine. Um, you can see that it doesn't apply to this link here. And in fact, this link is green when it's active, and it doesn't apply there. So, you know, quality engineering as usual. Um, Firefox also has interesting behavior when um, it believes that certain things in uh, content editable are invisible because content editable is very poorly specified, and so browsers just decide what they want to do. Um, Chrome's decision is to never allow the cursor to skip anything. Even if it's not visible, the cursor will still move. Sometimes it will visually appear to move a pixel backwards instead of forwards, which is a bug. But other than that, um, if it's physically there, the cursor will move, even if it's like you know visibility hidden or has a width zero or whatever. Um, in this case, however, I've managed to trick Firefox into thinking that this image is invisible because it doesn't have a source attribute. It does have, have an alt attribute, which is what's get, what gets rendered. Um, but it believes that it's invisible, and so what you get is this. The cursor just randomly decides to skip a position when you um, move over it, and so there are certain places that it's hard to get the cursor to even be in. And you know, if the image has a has an actual image, it's fine. Um, needless to say, this works on other browsers. Um, apparently, Firefox also decided that bottom padding is something that mankind doesn't deserve, because if you um, if you have a box with this box has, has completely equal padding on all sides. It's like 5 EM or something on all sides. Um, and the top thing, I deliberately chose an input box because in the default browser style sheet, it doesn't have a margin. And so on the bottom, you can see that there's, even though there's bottom padding, it's not being shown and the scroll bar does not extend to it because in the Firefox maintainers readers of the spec, um, that is not part of clippable content. It's not required to let you scroll down to it, even though on the top it is and on the right it is and on the left it is, but on the bottom, I don't know. Um, this is pretty horrible because your input like rides right up to the edge of the thing here. And in fact, if you try to do this in Chrome, then you will see that um, you actually do get space here between the bottom and the bottom. But you know, not in Firefox. And it's not actually even possible to work around this because if you try to do something clever by like using margins instead of paddings, which don't get clipped, uh, the margin will actually push up the scroll bar and it will look ugly. So that's unfortunate. The the yeah, the margin is outside of the scroll area. Um, I think you can do something like try to give the last element of, no, actually, if you give the last element a margin bottom, it also gets clipped. Because I think, or maybe it doesn't, you can probably do something with the last child gets a margin bottom or something, but you don't really want to have to do that. Um, this got resolved and valid in Firefox and Bugzilla because the, um, the maintainers disagree with uh, my reading of the specification and how it should be done, and they also disagree with Chrome and basically any other browser out there that isn't IE9 or something. Um, but you know, text areas totally deserve padding. They deserve lots of it, in fact, because um, in Firefox, if you give text area padding, instead of padding the inside, it will pad like around the text area and also squeeze the text in and squeeze the scroll bars in, which um, is completely wrong and looks horrible. Um, this I can show you to you live because they actually fixed it in Firefox 30, which came out two weeks ago. And that was especially speedy because the bug was only filed 12 years ago. Um, and actually, actually, the person who just entered the room, Liz Henry, was um, quite useful in helping us fix this bug because one of our coworkers, um, one of our coworkers got in touch with her and sort of managed to re reinvigorate interest in this 12-year-old bug and get it fixed. Um, I, you might just, you, this might hit you completely out of context, but thank you. Um, all right, so enough bashing of Firefox. Um, I want to do HTML parsing, and I want to do it in all browsers. Um, specifically, I want to take a 
string of HTML, and I want to get a DOM tree out of it. Now, this is pretty easy if you um, have a fragment, like something that isn't a full document. You can use like jQuery's parse HTML, but give you like an array of all the DOM elements, and you can like inject it into a div and then get the children out of there. Um, that's like a solved problem. But I have a document, which means that I have a doc type tag, I have an HTML tag, I have a head, which has a base URI in it, and all that kind of stuff. I want my links to, like, relative links to resolve correctly with the correct base and all that kind of stuff. This actually works, or rather, this is supposed to be supported in HTML and JavaScript um, because you can do it in iframes. And so that is how you would do it if you wanted broad browser support. Um, this is pretty horrible code. I'll walk through it in a second. But it will, you can get it to work in like any ancient browser, probably. Um, we've gotten it to work in pr some pretty ancient stuff. Basically, what you do is you create an iframe, you append it to the body, um, you extract its content document property, which is a document of that iframe. Then you can open the document. You can document.write to it, which is horrible and evil, but it works in this case. And then you can close it. And this whole open, write, close interface hasn't actually been used by anyone for non-evil purposes since probably actually 1995. Um, and then you, you throw the iframe away and you return a document. Um, this mostly works in modern browsers. It kind of doesn't work in IE8 because it doesn't believe in having a content document property, so you have to get the global namespace of that iframe and then get the document from that. And it will also um, garbage collect the iframe's document if you dare detach the iframe. So in IE8, if you detach the iframe, then if you try to then access the document immediately, it will still work. But if, an, if after like a short amount of time has elapsed, then uh, trying to access properties of the new document will throw an error. So you also can't detach the iframe. But you know, this is horrible. There needs to be a better way of doing this. And so the lovely people at W3C came up with a better way of doing this. And they came up with this thing called create HTML document. And it allows you to create a document, um, which I did. And then I have to bang my head against the wall a couple times and regex out my doc type and HTML tags. And then what's left of that, I um, inject as the inner HTML of the HTML tag. So this is better, but it's still pretty horrible. Um, now, the reason that I'm doing this is, well, for one, um, this is an actual quote from a coworker. Um, for one, um, this is what the spec pages tell me to do. This is like suggested usage, which is terrible. Um, but also, that parameter that I'm passing empty string in over here, it would be great if you could just pass like an HTML string into there. That would be awesome. But no, the W3C decided that what we actually want is to be able to pass a title. Because obviously, people are too lazy to just create a title tag and inject it into the head. Um, and I believe that Internet Explorer will, in fact, give you um, a document with a title tag always, even if you didn't ask for it. And it will be empty if you don't specify anything. OK. So obviously, this is also pretty terrible. So eventually, at long last, we now have something called DOM parser, which allows you to do basically this. You can just um, give it an HTML string, say, it's my times text HTML. It will parse it, and you will get your document. It's beautiful. Um, this is a repurposing of a very ancient interface. Um, it's been around for XML since like Chrome 1. And it's been around for SVG for slightly less long than that. But only recently did people start um, appropriating this for HTML. So um, Firefox started supporting the version 12, which was released a while ago. Then um, IE10 came out with it. Then a year went by, and Chrome decided they should support it too. Because you know they're a modern browser and everything, and they're leading edge or something. Um, obviously, Opera 17 supports it too, but it is literally the same as Chrome 30. And Safari still doesn't support it. But I've already given up hope on Safari. Um, also, because this is W3C, it's amazingly well specified. Like, it's exactly defined what the URL of the return document should be, and they totally haven't put in a table that compares what browsers currently do, and then put in this random dude's name who has a suggestion for what we should be, what we should be doing. Because, you know, it's a W3C and serious business. Um, OK, so, so I can parse things. Now I want to serialize things. So I want to take a DOM, and I want to, put, uh, I want to get an HTML string back. Fortunately, this is and has always been very easy. You can just get the outer HTML property of the root node of the DOM. Um, literally using outer HTML hasn't always been possible, but in most non-ancient browsers it is. And even if, 
it isn't, then you can, you know, you can work around it by using inner HTML and doing some stuff. It's fine. Um, however, I wouldn't have the slide in my presentation if there wasn't something going on here. So um, it turns out that the way the pre tags are parsed is kind of weird. So if you have the HTML pre, two new lines, and then the word foo, um, what you get back is a pre containing a text node containing the string a single new line and then foo, which is kind of weird. But in the spec, it actually says that the first new line after a pre tag and also a text area tag and a listing tag, which if you don't know what it is, don't worry, it's been deprecated ages ago. Um, if the first new line needs to be stripped and only the second and subsequent new lines are actually content. So, you know, that's kind of weird, but fine. And I can see why that would be, especially with text areas and stuff. Um, unfortunately, it does mean that because people are stupid, um, it led to pre-serialization being broken. Because if you take um, this, uh, the DOM that you get from the string and serialize it back, you get a pre-tag with one new line. Obviously, if you parse this, you will get a pre-tag with just foo and no new lines, because the first new line is optional and gets ignored. Um, and one of my favorite demonstrations of how broken it is is you can take a div with a pre that has lots of new lines and run div.innerHTML equals div.innerHTML, which obviously should not do anything ever, and run it a bunch of times, and you can watch the new lines disappear one by one. <laughs> which, is, which, by the way, this is a great party trick. Um, and so, of course, we actually have this code. Again, it has a different name. It's like, it's like is pre broken or something. But um, we actually, this is a literal copy paste from one of my code bases where we have code that creates a div, injects pre new line new line, and checks that the result from serialization is pre single new line because then your browser is broken. And um, it turns out that all browsers are broken except Opera 12 and below which those browsers in general are complete pieces of garbage, but they happen to be the only browsers that, ever have, that have ever implemented this correctly. Um, now, this, of course, there are reasons behind this. The spec hasn't always been very clear on what should happen here. And between like 2009 and 2013, it was the language and the spec surrounding pre-serialization was um, very vague, um, very ambiguous, and very incorrect in any reading. Um, and so everyone ignored it and just did what they thought was best which was what everyone else was already doing, and so they all copied the same mistake. Um, in 2013, the language in the spec was corrected, and so, of course, I filed bugs against both Firefox and Chrome um, to uh, fix this behavior. Um, Chrome hasn't responded to my bug because they never respond to any bugs, and um, the Firefox people have sort of equivocated and said, well, we don't really want to fix this because it might break compatibility with things, and it's like, well, you know, the current thing breaks compatibility with everything. So um, the workaround for this is um, we actually have code that, as I showed you, detects whether this is broken and then reaches into your DOM and injects new lines in like exactly the right places knowing that they will be eaten again later um, to ensure that everything gets serialized exactly right. Because if you're communicating with a Node.js service on the other side over the wire, then it's important that you don't drop new lines on the floor. Um, so the end of the story is not necessarily browsers suck. Browsers are actually pretty awesome. And so my last demo is going to be something that is actually uh, pretty amazing. Uh, this is a demo page that was made by a coworker of mine. Um, it um, uses content editable on the head tag and the body tag. So what you see up here, this is the actual title tag. And if you can, you may be able to see that I'm actually modifying the title of the page now. And there is no JavaScript on this page. This is just HTML and CSS. Um, I have standard content-editable features, like I can split this H1 if I want and unsplit it. And I don't know why I just did that, but I have undo, so it doesn't matter. Um, I can take text, and I can make it bold with Control-B. And I can even make it italic. Um, I can even have uh, do Control-I and then start typing, and it will automatically make things italic. Um, I can split this, and it will automatically generate a new paragraph and a new i tag. Um, I can even split this link here, and it will do all the right things. Um, I think I might be able to. Okay, tab to indent the list didn't actually work. That was too much to hope for. But you know, um, I don't have Comic Sans on my system, so this Fonts Family rule here doesn't actually work. But you know, I can do. Um, Liberation 
mono. And as you can see, I can actually live edit the CSS here. And if I don't like this light green, I can just make it red. Um, unfortunately, you can't actually press Enter in the style block because um, if you try to add new lines at the end, they will become BRs. And it turns out that BR tags aren't very valid CSS. But um, you can totally break line here and split the style tag. And you have two style tags. Now you can add more CSS. Um, so yeah, as much as browsers might suck and as much as we might curse them in our daily lives as we try to get weird things to work, they are actually pretty sweet. So that's all I got. Any questions from anyone? What's the URL for this? The URL for this is, um, unfortunately, I can't zoom the URL bar, but it's, uh, it's crinkle.github.io slash dom dash CEO. Um, I, I have it on this slide here. There it is. Um, this is not my invention. It was made by a coworker of mine who decided to show this off. And I shamelessly stole it. But you know, I'm sure it's CC by say, so we have appropriation. All right. Yeah. Just chasing this stuff down. Um, not as much as I feared, although I'm about to embark on a project where I'm trying to get all this code to work in IE 11. Um, so soon to be much, much more. Um, but in general, not too much. It depends on the kind of stuff that you're doing. It's like you will occasionally there will occasionally be bugs that turn out to have their roots in browser bugs like these, and you can spend a couple of days like you know, finding this and you have a thing and you write it down and eventually you make them all into a talk. But um, what I've shown you is probably like six months to a year of just randomly running into things. Yeah. I don't, I've always just had time with anything that has those things like anything. Uh-huh. It seems to me that there are situations where like it is completely ambiguous as to what should happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, in your example, you have absolute position of element next to my element. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, I, I wasn't able to incorporate this in my talk, but just yesterday I discovered that in Internet Explorer and even in Explorer 11, um, if you have a, so opacity, the opacity property in CSS inherits multiplicatively. So if you have something with opacity 50% and then something inside it that's also opacity 50%, you get 25. Um, it also means that if you have something with opacity 1 inside of something with opacity, say, 15%, like, you know, everything gets 15% from there and down. Um, unfortunately, in Inner Explorer, it doesn't work in one edge case, which is where the container that has opacity 15% um, has, no, has, like, zero dimensions, and everything inside is absolutely positioned outside of the container. Those things should still inherit the opacity, but in IE, they don't. But you're right. That's actually, you know, it's a pretty nasty edge case that you would probably never find unless you accidentally wrote code that exploits it. And in many cases, the specs are completely ambiguous and don't say what to do. Like the, um, the thing about pre-new line serialization at the time that I discovered it, um, what the specs said you should do was actually wrong. And that was why no one took the specs ser seriously, because it was wrong. And then in 2013, they fixed it. But they were like, well, you know, you should have told us that five years ago when we, implement, when we implemented this code. And, um, that is a problem. And as I showed you with the, the big red thing, like with the DOM parser spec, they still haven't decided what should happen to the document URL and everything that's, that's someone, and everyone else does something different. What is the logic for taking out the first line? Um, so the logic is if you have a text area tag in your, in your page, or a pre or a listings tag, but no one uses the latter anymore, then you want to be able to do the text area tag, new line, and then the first line of stuff. And because, you know, for readability, because you don't want to have to have your first line indented by this text area tag. And at the same time, you don't want that new line to be visible and removable by the person that ends up editing that text area. So that's why it's like ignored. And this is also why um, you can't actually use an XML parser to parse XML, even XHTML, because the parsing semantics are actually different. Um, I found this out um, if you try to, like, create a DOM that only has a section tag, then in HTML5 implementations, um, it will automatically get surrounded in like a video tag or something, because you're only supposed to use section inside of video. And so in XML, you can just do this. You can just create whatever tags you want. But in, in HTML, they might just randomly get um, surrounded in other tags or moved because you're not, you know, if you try to like put a div inside of a uh, T body or in TR or something, it will just end up being relocated outside of the table. Like, stuff like that will happen in HTML parses because they have semantics, and XML generally doesn't. Do you envision a world where you kind of write a library that deals with all these bugs and other projects can be used 
Um, yeah, so we, we've kind of done this. The UI library that we um, end up splitting out of a project at some point does work around most of these bugs to the extent that we can. And this is also why I believe that you should be using like things like widget libraries that like abstract a lot of this stuff. Um, and so like a lot of like you know the the, the space reserved for the scroll bar bug and the um, the box shadow bug and all that kind of stuff. That's stuff that we work around, and that we have widgets that work around them for you. But like you know, the font rendering bug, like you're not going to work around that. Oh yeah. Uh huh. Serif, yes. Yes, which for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, no matter what kind of font it was. And you have it on Windows and then it spread, or you have it on Mac and then it spread to Windows, like, ah. later. And it kept going, and, like, it, it, some people would never see it, and I would see it constantly. Yep. Like, you go to a page and you hover over it and it fixes the text. Yeah. And, like, so it had reported and fixed for, like, but, it, you know, it's always, like, three versions back, right? Yeah. And they're like, it's not urgent. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it's not a security bug, but like, you know, text renders wrong on half the yeah. websites on the, on the internet. That seems like a browser, but that would mm -hmm. be an bug. Yeah, I know. Um, and, and as I said, sometimes they just disagree. So Chrome tends to not respond to new bugs that I, I don't think they've ever responded to any bug that I've ever filed. Um, Firefox tends to respond, but often they disagree. There is a, there's another one that I d decided to drop from this talk for reasons of time. That's to do with if you have an SVG tag in Firefox and you try to make it with 100% height 100%, it actually is still 0 by 0 until you do mess around with other things like make both the HTML and the body with 100, height 100%, et cetera. Um, so it's really difficult to get an SVG tag to actually take up space in Firefox. Um, but um, I ran into a specific bug <laughs> that's about measuring an SVG tag where um, it took um, someone else, fortunately, not me, it took them three months of arguing with the person that maintains the SVG code in Firefox to convince them that if you have an, a tag called SVG in an HTML document, then the HTML rules for a property should, exist, uh, should apply, not the SVG rules. Because the height property that we're looking for was an HTML property, not an SVG property. And so this person was like, that's HTML, this is SVG, go away. And it was like, there was just like three months of endless arguing because before the subsystem maintainer could be convinced of a basic fact about, about his own subsystem. So, you know, sometimes stuff like that happens. Yeah, we have a problem. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, browsers have interesting opinions about what should be done with SVG. Um, this, um, I found this out when a coworker of mine wrote a little sort of side app thingy and that was using SVG, and it worked fine in Chrome, and then I, like, I ran it, and I got like a 10 by 10 pixel square. And I was like, what is going on? And so like, you know, four hours and some missed sleep later, I like put a pull request in that like rewrote half a CSS so that it would work in Firefox. And we're time. Sweet.